So I'm going to start with Patty McDowell, who is a 53-year-old woman. She's married and the mother of two children. She had a stroke with her first pregnancy some 20 years ago and had a more recent event, and she's going to fill you in on those details. So, Patty. I was sitting alone on the couch, 28 years old and nearly three months pregnant, when I felt the sensation of pins and needles migrate from one side of my face to the other. Although no one was in the room, I felt the need to speak, but could not. I became anxious and began to hyperventilate. I was right, rushed to the emergency room of a small local hospital where I was misdiagnosed with a hysterical pregnancy and then was discharged. But as I began throwing up blood on the hospital sidewalk, I knew something else was incredibly wrong. The warning signs were there. They began with relentless nausea and vomiting to the point of throwing up bile the color of antifreeze, a 16-pound weight loss, and migraines that tended to last for days at a time. Then while driving to work, I lost a peripheral vision in both of my eyes as bright spots invaded my limited sight. However, it wouldn't be until my admission to Mass General, the third hospital in as many days, when my true condition was realized. I had suffered a stroke with, in a, which a blood clot had destroyed 20% of my brain. My entire language center was gone, leaving me unable to speak, read, or write. Still, my deeper concern was for the health and well-being of my unborn child. Although it was found that the fetus was developing normally, I was now considered a high-risk pregnancy. I was put on aspirin therapy to prevent further strokes and eventually delivered a healthy full-term son, and I'm very grateful for this blessing. During my recovery, my doctor conveyed that the most significant progress is made within the first two weeks after a stroke, and the next milestone is the 18-month mark, after which progress is thought to be minimal. However, my inability to read a story to my son at the 18-month marker gave me the determination to surpass this milestone. Incredibly, it is now 22 years later, and I still continue to make amazing progress. I can functionally read, write, and speak, and to the layperson, I appear unimpaired. It was my mother who helped me to realize that the injuries that are not visible are the most difficult for others to acknowledge and appreciate. I know this to be true because although no one can readily see the aftermath of, aftermath of my stroke, it's there. I've learned many variable lessons in my own recovery, and I'd like to share some of those most important ones with you. Reactions vary. Family and friends all react differently in a crisis. Some cry, some overtalk to make up for your inability to do so, and some cannot utter a word, just hold you tightly. You will likely have a range of reactions as well, and accepting the way you feel and giving yourself permission to feel it is an essential, essential part of recovery. For example, during her first visit to see me in the hospital, my sister rolled herself in a fetal position at the foot of my hospital bed crying. This act gave me permission to also cry and to temporarily let down my stoic facade. Also, some visitors would speak loudly and slowly as though my hearing and intelligence were impaired simply because I was unable to express these capabilities. Although a stroke patient may not be able to speak, that doesn't mean that they cannot hear. So sensitivity is important. For example, I recall one person in my hospital room turning to another and hearing her say, I don't know why Patty doesn't just have an abortion. This baby is killing her. Rehabilitation is crucial. Take occupational and th speech therapy sessions very seriously. The more progress you make early on, the better foundation for future progress. Listen to music. I listen to songs with sentences in them as much as possible, especially when I slept, since my hearing was magnified in this relaxed state. I was told that these songs help teach your neurons to make needed connections for speech. Exercise your brain as you would an injured muscle. One main method of brain exercise is writing, so I personally set aside 45 minutes each day to write and stuck with it despite the nausea that it initially created. Support and advocacy can be a safety net. Support from loved ones can provide a sense of security during an uncertain time. Also, if you cannot advocate for yourself, it is important for trusted others to do so for you. A positive attitude gives you strength. Remember that even when things seem bleak, maintain a positive attitude and never lose hope. A positive outlook can give you strength to accomplish what others may deem impossible. The mind is powerful. I would focus on not only what I could do to survive, such as to keep solid food down to build my strength, but what I could do to overcome my challenges. 
I have no language center, and yet I can speak to all of you. Through years of hard work, I have trained other parts of my brain to compensate for what I have lost. Immediately following my release from Mass General, I worked with a speech and language therapist who told me that progress varies with each individual. On my first day of speech therapy, I could not recite the alphabet in its entirety and somehow thought that LMNOP was a word, but eventually recovered to where I am today. I also compensate for my short-term memory loss by using an agenda book and by writing things down as I've done to deliver this presentation. Challenging yourself results in progress. At first, I began driving short distances upon my discharge from the hospital. Years later, I founded and led a town-wide project to create a playground where physically challenged and typically functioning youth could play together. I have learned that by testing one's limits, significant progress can be made. And to control what you can and just let go of the rest. Mass General recommended as a stroke victim, I undergo several therapies for Several, several therapy sessions for his post-traumatic stress syndrome. During these sessions, it was made clear that the sense of helplessness I felt was common. I felt that I was a captive in my own body, meaning that I could not stop the vicious cycle of vomiting and headaches until I gave birth, nor could I prevent the stroke or its aftermath. The therapist gave me an important coping tool that I used on my first flight alone with my then infant son and continue to use today. To overcome the feeling of helplessness, she suggested that I write a letter explaining my medical condition and what the flight attendant could do in case I had another stroke rendering me speechless. I drafted this letter, included emergency contact information, and sealed it in an envelope. When I was seated for the flight, I shared the contents with the flight attendant and placed the letter in my pocket. I felt immediate relief and surprising sense of control over my own health and well-being and that of my son. This was one of the most important steps in my personal recovery. I never felt helpless again. Then, in 2010, I suffered a pulmonary embolism while driving. In pain, I couldn't breathe air in or out of my lungs, but deemed the problem stress-related and continued the drive home. When the difficulties persisted into the second day, and I noticed pain radiating from the inner right calf, I contacted my doctor. After a series of tests, it was determined that I had a small clot lowered, lodged in the lower right quadrant of my lung. The clot likely originated in my right leg. I was, it was also concluded that I had a patent formalin ovale, a PFO, or a small hole in the atrial septum of my heart, and antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, a disorder that produces antibodies which attack needed phospholipid binding proteins in blood, causing abnormal clotting. Despite the knowledge of medical advances since my stroke in 1989, the news was shocking, and it begged the still unanswered question, was my stroke the result of a clotting disorder or from complications brought on by my pregnancy as was first believed? Nonetheless, I spent the next five days at MGH receiving Lovenox injections in an effort to reduce further incidence of clots as doses of Coumadin were being loaded into my system. Over a th three to four week period, the pain in my lung and labor breathing subsided as the clot dissolved. I currently take an 81 milligram dose of aspirin once daily to guard against strokes and Coumadin each evening to reduce the risk of another pulmonary embolism due to my lifelong clotting disorder. Although my philosophy has always been more homeopathic, I'm religious about taking these medications because I know it's crucial for my overall health and well-being. These life-threatening experiences have shown me the true extent of my own capabilities and inner strength, as well as my will to not only survive, to, but to thrive. It is my sincere hope to convey that with a powerful human spirit, positive attitude, diligence, and perseverance, achieving remarkable things is possible. This is a philosophy that I've imparted to my children and that one I also continue to live by. Thank you.